introduce our, our speaker of the hour, uh, a man by the name of Pastor Paul Esposito. And, and I met Pastor Paul, we are doing um, some radio um, programs for a while at his radio station. I didn't really know him, but had heard of him. And, and so I went up there and we had, had a radio uh, program up there. And by the way, we're thinking about going back into that. We're prayerfully doing, uh, looking at that now. But, but I met him then, and, and that was some years ago. And we just clicked right away. It just seemed like we clicked right away. And, and, and it was just a blessing to have known him over the years. And we still cross paths in regard to some of the men's ministries that we go to. We both tend to do the same ones, maybe at different times. And when I'm available, I come to his. And when he's available, he comes to mine. And, and he actually had me to come up to his church not too long ago and, and preach there. And, and I wanted to always be, get, get him back down. But I know as a senior pastor, it's hard to get out of uh, your church when you preach every Sunday. But he worked it out in regard to the dates and the times. And the Lord has blessed us to, to be able to sit under him. But, and, and a lot of times when we when we introduce somebody, we try to we try to build them up and 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 throw out all their accolades. And in regard to his academics, if I did that, we'd be here for a while. But but I know he doesn't major on that. But, so what I did, I found something on Facebook in a small corner right under his name. And I just simply want to read that. And it simply said, Pastor Paul Esposito, I am a pastor, a Bible teacher, a radio manager, and a husband. And he wrote at the end, it says, living on borrowed time. And, and, and I love that. Because he realizes that God has called him to be these things and he's working for the Lord everywhere he has him. And he realizes that his time is only short here on this earth. And so as long as he can, He's going to be a blessing to everywhere God sends him to bring forth his word. Now, I happen to know on good authority that, that he is fluent in, 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 in biblical Greek, but, but I know he's not going to preach to us in Greek. He, he's going to go ahead and, and, and preach to us in English, and, and I know the Lord's going to use him by me. Um, at this time, I'd simply like to introduce to my, our congregation, our dear friend, Pastor Paul Esposito. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate that. You had to bring up living on borrowed time. <laughs> See, that came about when I drove to New Jersey to do the wedding for my daughter, who will watch this video, start crying again. Because on my way back from that wedding, I fell asleep on I-95 at like 80 miles an hour, probably a dozen times. But one particular time, I hit a car at 80 miles an hour at 11 o'clock at night in the dark, and the damage to my truck is about a half inch rubber mark. And I realized then that I should have died that night. You know, sometimes, haven't you ever known that you know that you know that you know that you just know that you should have died and someone intervened, maybe an angel, yes, in your life? Have you ever had that happen to you? Yes. yes. Yeah, there's a lot of amens to that. We're going to find out after we die all the times that God intervened in our life. And that was one of them for me. And when I got home, I changed my Facebook and put on there, living on borrowed time. Because I understood then that God was not done with me yet. And God's not done with you yet either. And no one can take out the saint until their work on earth here is done. No cancer, no banana peel, and certainly no devil. No one can take you out until your work is done. And when it's done, you might slip on a banana peel. You might get into a traffic accident. Like we all have known someone who's passed away maybe in a traffic accident. But I'm grateful to be here today. I thank Pastor Ralph for the opportunity to <coughs> preach. Nice cold morning, isn't it? Yeah, refreshing. It's... Uh, Slightly too cold to go golfing, probably. I heard the story of uh, Moses and Peter and Jesus on the golf course. 
So Moses is out here. You know, Moses had a problem with anger. So he's up here, hits his ball, goes right into the water. So he pulls a Bo Jackson, gets his club, breaks it over his knee. Next guy up is Jesus. He hits his ball, lands in the water. So he walks on the water, gets his club, <laughs> shoots it down in two. So the third player gets up, hits his ball, goes into the water. Largemouth bass grabs the ball. Then a hawk comes down, picks up the bass, takes him over the hole, drops it right in the hole, and Jesus turns to his partner and says, Nice shot, Dad. <laughs> That's good. i got to get everyone to smile at least once here prior to going on here and what we're going to look at here today. Uh, my sermon here today is entitled, Is It I? I wanted to preach something else. I told Pastor Ralph I was going to preach something else, but God had something else in mind. You don't want to hear what I want to tell you. You want to hear today the message that God has put on my heart to preach to you here this morning. And that's what we're... So with that in mind, we're in Matthew chapter 26, and we're about to enter into the hour of darkness. I notice on the bulletin that you've got the pages to turn to on that. I'm using a smorgasbord of King James, New King James, and we're going to wrap it up with a little New American Standard. I won't get shot for using the New American Standard, will I, down here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Matthew chapter 26. Now Jesus told those who arrested him in the garden that this is your hour and the power of darkness. You see, the time has come where God is going to let <laughs> Satan have his way for a little while which ought to concern him. Because if God is letting you have your way, you, being evil, better take notice. Because something bad is about to happen to you. And Satan is going to do something, as always, that he thinks is in his best interest. I'm just going to turn this thing around five or ten times before we're done. Let me just not touch the pulpit. <laughs> Satan is going to do something he thinks is in his best interests. And that is here in this case to destroy Jesus. And like a lion eyeing out a lame caribou, Satan knows his victim. Because the devil has been studying his victim. Satan knows which of the caribou, or sheep, if you prefer, is the weakest. When it comes to the kingdom of God, the weakest is always the most worldly in the bunch. It's never the oldest. It's the most worldly. You can be a hundred years old and have Satan scared to death of you. It's by what's on the inside of you. Not how old you are. Not if you have a wheelchair or not. He would crush all of us if he could. But it's Christ in you is what he's afraid of. See, that's the little secret he doesn't want you to know. It's it's the Christ in you that he's afraid of. You know, the Bible tells us someday, one of these days, forgive me cameraman, but the time is going to come where we're going to see this devil for what he really looks like. And people are going to say, are you the man... He's a little pencil neck little. Are you the man? The world's going to look and see him for what he really is and say, are you the man? Everyone was afraid of you. That's how it's going to be. Remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. You've got authority over him, otherwise you would have been dead a long time ago. I always hear Adrian Rogers say, don't you think the devil would have taken you out if he could have? My, aren't you a friend of the devil? <laughs> he doesn't have authority over you. 
Okay, let me move on here. When it comes to the kingdom of God, the weakest is always the most worldly. The weakest is the one who fails the John 12, 25 test. That is, whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it unto life eternal. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm having a hard time with that verse. It's a work in progress. Whoever hates his life will keep it. So don't feel bad if you're not there. Now, Jesus warned of this spiritual condition. As we read here in another place, he says, These likewise are those that are sown on stony ground who when they heard the word immediately received it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves, and they only endure for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they stumble. King James says they are offended. Everyone's offended today. Right? The whole world's offended. Isn't that funny? That's one of the greatest prophecies in all the Bible. Is this is how you'll know when it's the time of the end. When everyone's offended. That's what it says. That's what it says. In Matthew 24, the Lord's discourse. What will be the sign of your coming? And at the end of the world, you'll know the end of the world is near when everyone's offended at everyone. That's what the word says, if that matters. And I know in this church it matters because of the pastor here. I know I fit right in following him. Had the privilege of putting his radio shows on the air for five years, so I know what to expect from him here. That you won't throw me out. <laughs> Though the day's young. <laughs> The New American Standard calls these people that start off in the faith temporary. So I'm wondering, what, pray tell, is a temporary Christian? Tell me. I asked my church, why are you here? To find a wife? To find a healing, even? Now, Jesus says, you're just here because you're hungry. <laughs> the only reason you're here is because you had a roast beef sandwich on the other side of the water. <laughs> and now you follow me here. He said it. Why are you here today? So these are those like sick caribou. Don't you ever watch those shows? Don't you feel sorry? I always do for that poor sap. That poor caribou who all them lions jump up and eat. See, Satan does the same thing with us. He's been following you and man since time everlasting. And he knows you. <clears throat> Those are the ones, like I said, sick caribou. These are the ones that the roaring lion will go after. Those who care more about their own hide than trusting in God. Whereas the strongest of the bunch say, bring it on, Smedley. Bring it on. The strongest know the word of God and say, what can man do to me? The strongest remember his ancient church history and declares like a man named Polycarp. Anyone ever hear of Polycarp? He was the Bishop of Smyrna, learned from the Apostle John. And he was 86 years old when they came to him and they say, swear allegiance to Caesar. And he said, 86 years old. He said, and I quote, 86 years I have served him and he's done me no wrong. Bring forth what thou wilt. 86 years old, are you able to say that? Hallelujah. That's the kind of attitude you see. Bring forth what thou wilt. You can't hurt me. For our momentary light affliction is working out for us. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 
What can man do to me? What can man do? Right, nothing. Satan is scared of you. The weak caribou is the worldly caribou. Not the spiritual one. I hear John Hagee say, some of you couldn't get a used demon to chase after you. <laughs> Eighty and six years have I served you. So, my question is, can you say that? How's your attitude today, church? I love the attitude of King David. Listen to what he wrote. I love in the Bible the when and then. You see, when and then. Then always follows when. You see, he had such a trust in the when that the then was given. And he says this. He says, when I cry out to you, then my enemies are scattered. This I know because God is for me. Do you have that kind of trust in God today? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will scatter. You see, Satan is scared of you. He doesn't want you to know that. You've got everything it takes to chase away any demon from you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You've got what it takes. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? By the way, that's Psalm 56, verses 9 through 11. I've got these verses. If you want them, Pastor, maybe you can make a copy of a handout I've got. That's got every verse here of everything I'm going to say here today. Now keep that in mind as we move forward in Matthew 26 and get a bird's eye view of the Last Supper knowing this morning that Judas Iscariot is the weak caribou, okay? Because of his worldliness. That's why. Matthew 26, verse 1. Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas. And they plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast lest there be an uproar among the people. Sounds like the United States government. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Come on, do it in public. Turn the lights on. <laughs> not saying one thing one way or the other. I care about the word of God, not about politics personally. But what are you going to do? Do it at no kangaroo courts. Do everything out in the open. Let the people decide. And likewise here, this trial of Jesus, this was a kangaroo court. They don't meet at night. Now to accurately portray what happens next, let me give you a little more of this story, this account, from the Gospel of John, chapter 12. You can turn there if you'd like. I'm going to read uh, John 12. We're going to be in and out between John 12 and 13 and Matthew 26. John chapter 12, verse 1. Then, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table, or sat at meat with, them, with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Ah, oh, you see, now we're getting down to it here. I'm trying to fill in the lines here of what some of the other gospel writers leave out. 
Verse 5, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? New American Standard says, why didn't you give this to all the poor people? Then he said, not that he cared for the poor people, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box. And he used to take what was put into it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always. But me you do not have always. Then in John chapter 13 verse 1 we read this. Now before the feast of the Passover. When Jesus knew that his hour had come. That he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own that were in the world. He loved them to the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Don't you love that old hymn? Yes. Loved them to the very end. And supper being ended, comma, <clears throat> the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God, and that he was going to God, man, what, a, what an English teacher's nightmare. It's all one sentence. He'd come from God and he was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. All right, now back to our main text in Matthew, but keep a finger there. We'll be back there. In a moment. Matthew 26, verse 17 now. Now on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus. All right, now first, there's not an error in the Bible when he says the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They used to lump all those together here. Passover. Remember, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the day after Passover. So it's not that there's an error in the Bible. He's lumping them all together under one holiday, okay? There's no errors in the Bible. The Bible is perfect. There's no, no errors. There's nothing wrong with it. It's infallible. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and said to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man. Say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them. And they prepared the Passover. Now when evening had come, everyone with me? We're in Matthew 26, 20. Now when evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, or when you see the word verily in the King James Version, you know what the Hebrew word is, or Greek? It's the word amen. Amen is Hebrew, transliterated in the Greek. Amen. It means, as they would say before the old TV show, you can bet your sweet bippy. <laughs> what was that? Assuredly. Verily, you can write this down and take this to the bank to put in New Jersey vernacular. <laughs> Assuredly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. Now, Matthew, the gospel writer, is writing with his Joe Friday from Dragnet would write, which is what? The Just the facts. Yeah. Thank you. But John gives us Jesus' heart. Listen to John 13, 21. When Jesus had thus said this, he was troubled in his spirit. And he testified. Oh, hand on the Bible. The other hand up. He testified. I'm in John 13, 21. He testified and said, Verily, verily. All right. Now he's going to say amen twice. And anytime you see something twice in the Bible, it's to show you something is emphatic, it's very important. Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
that one of you will betray me. And they were, look what it says here, they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? You see, would you say that? How about you? Is it I? Which one of you guys would say that to God, by the way? Huh? Yes. Yes is the answer I'm looking for. Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And these guys knew him. He's well, that's 2,000 years removed. They knew him and they still. They knew the color of his eyes. Would you say that to God? But when Peter stands up and says, it might be all of them, but not me, I'd never do that. All of us in the church for the last 2,000 years laugh at Peter and call him impulsive and say that he was too bold with his speech. Am I right, Ralph? That's right. <laughs> to be honest, Peter's the one who speaks for all of us. We all think I'd never do that, but Peter's the only one that's got the guts to say, I wouldn't do that. I don't care if all of you people do that. I would never do that. <laughs> Catch the arrogance of the man. I would never do that. We all think that way. Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? But not Peter. Peter's, nope, it ain't me. Might be all of you folks, but don't look this way. I don't betray my Lord. But the one who denies it is the one who does it. <coughs> Let me ask the question, how about your denial today? Let's confront that this morning. Do you deny that this could happen to you? Or do you legitimately ask like the others, <coughs> Lord, is it I? Lord, it's 11-13, November 17, 2019. Will I betray you before I get home? If they bust down my door and say, are there any Christians? Like they do in everywhere else in the world, except here. What will you do? Is it I? Or will it be, you can bust into all these other houses. I know all these people, they'll deny you. But me, I go to church. I won't deny you. My grandmother was Christian. I'd never deny you. I own three Bibles. I went to Bible college. I'd never deny you. Right? See, Jesus was actually, I won't call him incorrect, I'll say, he only gave you half the truth. Not just one person was going to deny him, but two deny him. The other put his hand on a stack of Bibles, raised his other hand and said, I, bleep de bleep, I have never heard of Jesus Christ. Write that down, take it to the back. Let me say, don't try that at home. You see, the Bible says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Understand that Paul said, in me, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. We're all capable of doing what Jesus, but what Peter did or Judas. The question is, how are you going to respond when you do it? The Bible says, worldly sorrow produces death. Like killing yourself and suicide and taking your life. But godly sorrow, where's that in the Bible? I'm glad you asked that. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow produces repentance unto salvation. Peter went out and wept bitterly. But he got on his knees and repented from what he did. 
And you see, this is why our Savior didn't die in vain, people. He shed His blood even, let's put it this way, there is no <laughs> sin that you have committed here at this church that you cannot be forgiven of today. No matter what you've done, Pastor Ralph will lead you through it here at the end of this service and give it unto God. There's nothing you've done, no matter what anyone's whispering in your ear. The truth is, Jesus said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. The truth is, you can be forgiven of everything you've done. Godly sorrow brings about repentance leading unto salvation. That's the truth. Now, Judas went out and hung himself. And that's worldly sorrow. This is why this liberal way of exiting this world is wrong. Because it's worldly sorrow. There's no repentance from taking your own life. How about this novel thought? God is sovereign. He's in charge. If I didn't die driving 80 miles an hour, hitting a car on the highway... He cares about you too. And when your time comes, all right, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. How does that sound? How about to live as Christ, but to die as what? Gain. Gain. God is in control. Let me move on. We've gotten way off here. I don't know how we got there. <laughs> Now this word from Jesus was so unexpected that one of you will betray me. That they had to look around at each other to see who in tarnation he was talking about. Isn't it funny how they all didn't turn around and all look at Judas and say, I knew it the whole time. Nobody did that. But they looked around at, oh, oh, is it you? Is it you? They looked at, no one knew who he was talking about. Matthew 26, 23. So we answered, I need some water around here. <laughs> he answered and said, I'm in Matthew chapter 26, verse 23. He says, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? All right, you've got to be joking, right? How can he not know? That's like someone saying, one of you is going to shoot President Kennedy. And Lee Harvey Oswald says, Is it I? <laughs> Is it I? How can he not notice? Now, let's go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. This time, I'm going to read this from the New American Standard. Forgive me if you don't like that Bible. They're very literal. John, chapter 13. Verse 21. Now when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit, and he testified and said, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, one of you will betray me. So the disciples began looking at one another, at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. Now there was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples. Now let me explain that. When it says they sat at meat or they were reclining, that's the way that they would sit in those days. They would like lie on their side with their head on their elbow. My head to the person's chest behind me. His elbow to the person's chest behind him. They reclined on their sides. That's why the New American Standard says they were reclining at the table. They were a literal instead of giving you a figure of speech saying they were at me. It all means the same thing, but the New American Standard is just being a little more literal, okay? So there was reclining 
on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who it is, who he's speaking. So he, leaning back on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Then Jesus answered, It is the one for whom I'll dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon. Now, after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Now, notice the timing. Notice when this happened. After he gave, it's like this sealed the deal. He had even up to this time to repent. As we do. As you do. Here today at 20 after 11. There's still breath in you. You've still got time to turn and repent. That's why it says today if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. Like the Jews did in the rebellion. So, after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Now, there's a word here that's not in the King James that should be. And it's the next word after it. And the word is, therefore. It's the Greek word, um, O-U-N. That 90, 999 times out of a thousand is translated as therefore. Occasionally, very few times, is translated as then. Catch it now, let me read it to you. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. So let me ask the question, if that is correct, who is Jesus talking to? Satan. Satan. Let me read it again. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly, which the next verse attests to. Verse 28, it says, Now no one of those reclining at the table knew why he said this, because he wasn't talking to Judas. He was talking to the devil. Verse 29, some were supposing, because Judas, Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, Buy the things you need for the feast or else that he should give something to the poor. But notice how the word therefore changes the meaning of this text. Is it I? Is it I? So what's a person to do? First, understand the problem and our condition. And again, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. The problem is pride and arrogance on our part. We, like Peter, think we could never do something like that. I'd be aghast at the idea that I could ever deny Jesus Christ. And they all just said, is that I, I bet just to cover themselves, but they all felt like Peter did, oh, I could never do that. I could never deny Jesus Christ. You know, we think of the same thing, too, back in the Jews wandering around, don't we, for 40 years? How they're walking, walking, through, the, walking through the waves one day, and then they're molding an image the next, and we say, oh, I could never do that. I could never do that. So, Proverbs 16, 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Meaning, instead of saying, that could never be me, I would never do that, the response from all of us should be, is it I? Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Am I the one? Am I the one that will do this to you? So that's our problem. It's pride. And forgetting that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Church, your flesh is not born again. Your spirit's born again. Sin has got a 99 year lease in your body. For free. It pays no rent. 
It lives there for free. The question is, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with your soul? You got to fill and flood your soul with the Word of God. That's how you win that fight. You got an even fight, spirit against flesh. The flesh wars against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. How do you win that? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You win this fight by spending time in this book. Taking the word of God on the inside of you. Meditate on the word. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. That's how you win this fight. Here's a solution that God gave me for this question. Because by the way, the solution to every problem is always found in the Word of God. For everything that you're going through. Not just my, not, not at all my opinion, unless if my opinion comes from here. This is the only one that matters. There's a solution to every problem in the Word of God. And here's the solution God gave me for this problem. It's Psalm 92, verse 12 and 13. It says this, and then we're done. Psalm 92, verse 12, it says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. I looked up cedar this morning. A cedar in Lebanon is eight foot thick and 40 meters high. That's kind of like redwood tree, isn't it? I mean, isn't an eight foot thick tree rather large? Even bigger than these ficus trees that are growing everywhere. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. See, now he's going to add to that in verse 13. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. That's the answer to the question. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord. And the house of the Lord is anywhere where two or three are gathered together in the name of Jesus. There was no church until the second century building. This is the church building. Where you and you and you and you are all gathered together. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree and he will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. That's my encouragement to you is to be planted right here in the house of God. Have your roots established here in this house. This is his house where two or more of you are gathered together and you will flourish wherever the Lord sends you. See, this is where you hear from God. This is where you get your victory. You come in here, you're open to the Holy Spirit speaking to you. He'll reveal your sin to you, give you the opportunity to turn and repent. You get your batteries recharged here. You get your marching orders here. And then when you hit those doors, you're going to prepare. That does not come watching the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I used to say Miami Dolphins, but we're too far up north for that. It only comes through being here. That's the worst curse could ever happen to you is inheriting season tickets. Because then, once you inherit season tickets, you're just like everyone else out here in the world. Satan says, skin for skin, mm. all that a man has he will give in exchange for his life. you got to be grounded right here. Remember, you're never above falling or incapable of falling. And I leave you with this verse here. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. What are the desires of the flesh? The desires of the flesh are putting your hand down, raising your other one and saying, I've never heard of Jesus Christ. 
That is what the flesh will have you do. But those that are firmly grounded in the house of the Lord will say, like Polycarp did, 80 and 6 years. For me, it's 50 and 6. Maybe it's 80 or 30 and 6, 40 and 6. Whatever it is, you'll say, I am the Lord's. I will not fall. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for having our backs. Thank you for the truth of John 8, 32, that we will know the truth, and the truth will make or set us free. Thank you for showing us that we have got the victory. Indeed, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Pastor. Praise the Lord. We thank Pastor Esposito for bringing the word. Thank you, sir. Didn't dumb it down. Didn't water it down. Simply gave it to us like God gave it to him. And I thank him for that. We need that. I need that. I, I, I had forgotten. I, I got a, a, a senior moment. I forgot Beth's name. And, and, and the reason why I wanted to remember by her, wanted to remember her name and her name tag is stuck all the way over. I'm like... <laughs> Bring your name tag around. The reason why I wanted to remember her name is he was talking about an accident. And when she walked in the door today, she said that her car was totaled and, and, and in an accident last Monday. And she looks at it and sees it's all torn up. There's nothing they can do with it. But she said, I need to praise God because I am safe today because he had his mercies around me and his hedge of protection around me. And, and listen, this Pastor Paul was talking about, listen, we're not leaving here until God says it's time. She's here and a living witness and even testified of that same fact. I, I'm, a, I'm a person that does not like to re-preach someone else's sermon, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just simply going to close out. But as he was talking and he was asking about who do we trust and I remembered on this dollar bill, by the way, I only had one. It was in my wallet. <laughs> so, so I took it out, and I happened to look on the back, and it says, In God we trust. And look, that used to be the motto of our land, but it ought to be the motto of we who know Jesus as Lord and Savior. As the disciple says, Lord, there's nowhere else for us to go. You have the answer. You have the truth of life and death. And for us, there is no place else to go. If you would, let's give the Lord a hand clap for using our dear pastor. <laughs> At this time, we close the prayer, so I'm not going to reintroduce prayer. But I will ask is that anyone here who knows that they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ in the pardon of their sin, as we close out this part of the service, that you make your way up to see me and allow me to explain the way of Christ to you even that much more. I, I, I look at Sister Elvin and he was saying how a, a polycarp said, I've been serving the Lord for 86 years. And, and Sister Elvin can make the claim that I've been serving the Lord for over 100 years. And, and there's not a lot of folk walking on earth that can do that. Right. If you need to, 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 to do business with Jesus, please, as we stand and we close out, I would ask that you make your way up to see me. And Father, we simply uh, bow now to thank you for the food, the spiritual food that we received. Lord, we thank you for blessing our dear brother and, and Lord, even giving him the power and, and the impact that he had today on our hearts and on our lives. And Father God, we thank you that, you're, uh, that he was obedient. They even switching up his sermon, Father God, and this was needful for this day. And Father, we ask that you would bless the food that we're going to receive and for Lord, bless it for our nourishment as well as our enjoyment as we pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Amen. Please wait a minute. Let them, uh, hospitality ministry get set up. And God bless you.